We're live. Great. Um, I think we'll just follow the flow for narrators. Does that work for folks? Cool. So this is Lindsay speaking. Um, hello and welcome to Unsettling Dramaturgy's launch for our Praxis sessions for virtual collaboration. In the four part series um, we're in now, we're addressing approach An exciting and uh, an exciting learning moment has happened in just this moment. As we were announcing we are beginning, one of our narrators' video feed froze. Our process is to continue, and we look forward to Lindsay rejoining us. Um, I believe I will pass the microphone to Rue to begin our land acknowledgement. Welcome to the Unsettling Dramaturgy Praxis session. Tanake, Niatala St. George Warren, Yaniswara, Yank Katabare, Nia, Nitem Ru, Yaksuna, Wanda George Warren, Tatewana, Buck George, Yankampin Sawachahare, Hawo, Manuke Katabare, Hawo Iswam, Manu Ilahare. Hi, everyone. My name is Delessin George Warren, um, but everyone calls me Ru, like kangaroo. Uh, I'm a citizen of Kataba Nation. Uh, we call ourselves the people of the river because we've lived along the river we'd say since the world began. Uh, we are the only federally recognized tribe in the state of South Carolina and one of two in North Carolina. I gave a traditional introduction, which includes my family because uh, we're all family. And so I'm the son of Wanda George Warren, uh, who was our tribal administrator for a decade and the grandson of Buck George, who was our uh, assistant chief for almost 30 years. I'm an artist and educator because uh, in our language, those two responsibilities are tied in together. Uh, if you are an artist, you are automatically an educator and vice versa. And so I also wanted to give thanks to our land and our river. Um, and I'm calling to you from our Green Earth Reservation, um, uh, which is part of our traditional lands down here. So um, in the structure that we have, one with where Lindsay was, and I hope that she'll pop up soon. And now I'm saying I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable. So if that happens, you know, we'll just keep filling in. And Lindsay's back. Hi, Lindsay. Um, you know, we cut off right as you were giving that introduction. Um, Rue introduced themselves. Um, so if you just want to pick up from where you were, um, I think you had said, welcome to Unsettling Dramaturgy's launch. Um, so. Yeah. Let's just keep going with intros and then I can dive back in where I was. I think that'll that'll work if that's okay with everyone. So okay. Maybe... Um, so Rue, could you give um, also just for for everybody else um, a phys physical description, how you are, your access needs, um, uh, any other, uh, um, Claudia? My colleagues, I, I love that we're doing transparent facilitation. This is a beautiful way to work together. I believe according to our script, we had land acknowledgements to begin. We were going to have a, some opening statement from Lindsay that got interrupted, then doing our, um, uh, our, our framing topics and then full introductions from all of us. Um, I believe we were just doing our land acknowledgements for this first opening moment. Okay. In, in our, um, uh, great, let's do our land acknowledgements. Um, Mia. Hi, my name is Mia Susan Amir and I am uh, calling in from the unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, colonially known as Vancouver, British Columbia. And I'm really thrilled to be with all of you today. Uh, Jessica? Uh, 
Am I unmuted? <laughs> this is always my my uh, my digital obstacle. Um, this is Jessica speaking. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Watkin. Um, I'm calling in from the original territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Wendat, and the Mississaugats of the Credit River here in Ticoronto or Toronto, Ontario. Um, and it is the meeting place. So I'm really grateful to gather with everyone and meet you all here today. Thank you. This Claudia. is uh, Claudia Alex speaking. I'm calling from the Bay Area, land of the Ohlone peoples. The people are still alive. And I'm also taking a moment to recognize all enslaved, displaced and incarcerated peoples past and present. Passing the mic to Andrea. Hi, I'm Andrea Kovich. I'm calling in from the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish, including the Duwamish, the Quamish, and Mokoshu nations. Specifically, I'm situated on the lands of the first peoples of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. I live and work on as an un, um, uninvited settler on lands stolen from the Duwamish over 160 years ago. And I just wanted to honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish people. Check, passing it on. Carmen. Hi, everybody. My name is Carmen Papalia. I'm calling in from the, um, sorry, I'm calling in from the unceded and occupied territories of the Squamish, um, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, I, yeah, I'm happy to be able to gather in this way and talk about accessibility and meeting together and, and acknowledging land. Um, also happy that the um, cherry blossoms are in bloom here where I am. So thank you. Uh, let's see, Jessica. Uh, my name is Jessica Shocks. I'm Métis Canadian, living as an uninvited guest on the traditional territory of the Cowichan Nation. Jessica, um, your voice is a little bit muffled. I wonder if you could move closer to your microphone, perhaps, or... Is that better? It is better, yeah. New technology. Uh, Tanche, my name is Jessica Shocks. I'm Métis Canadian, living as an uninvited guest on the traditional territory of the Cowichan Nation. Uh, also known as Duncan, BC. This uh, uh, area is part of the Hokaminam Treaty Group, which is in stage five treaty negotiations. Uh, I'm thankful to live here in the Kawatsun, the warm lands where I am never far from the river. This is Lindsay Eels. Um, I'm calling as an uninvited white settler from Miskawatsi Waskekan, which is so-called Edmonton, a traditional gathering place of the Blackfoot, Cree, Papas Chase, Dene, Iroquois, Inuit, Nakota Sioux, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, and Métis Nations. Um, and again, from another gathering place, it feels, um, yeah, I'm really grateful to be gathering in this space as well. I'm Grant, they, them. Uh, I'm calling from the traditional and unceded territory of the Multnomah. Clackamas, Kathlamet, and Kalapuya people, as well as many other unnamed bands, a uh, settler named Portland, Oregon, United States of America. Uh, I wanna offer acknowledgements as well to the nearby confederated tribes of the Grand Ronde, whose ancestors survived the Oregon Trail of Tears and restored their tribal status in 1983 after termination by executive order in 1954. Thank you, everyone. This is Lindsay speaking again. I'm gonna do the intro again that that I got halfway through and realized our order, my order was all messed up. So uh, welcome to nonlinear and incoherent 
facilitation, <laughs> part of cripping practice. Um, hello and welcome to Unsettling Dramaturgy's launch of our practice sessions for virtual collaboration. It's a four part series where addressing approaches to and practices in online convening that set, center unsettling, decolonization, indigenization, and disability justice in process design. The seri series emerged from our year plus of work and research in transnational convening and creative collaboration through virtual means. The series has been developed as our response to turn towards online organizing that has followed the COVID-19 crisis. The second section in our series, which is today, centers on cripping practice in virtual cross-geographic collaboration. Check. Unsettling Dramaturgy is an ongoing project bringing together Crip and Indigenous dramaturgs from across so-called Canada and the United States who work in theatre, dance, and experimental performance. Using digital platforms, we gather to build relationships, to explore and document the critical convergences and divergences in our experience and work, to amplify Crip and Indigenous aesthetics, ethics, practices, and leadership in our local, national, and international performance ecologies, to push the conversations from inclusion to centering, from reconciliation to unsettling and decolonization. This project proposes a continuation of the thriving legacies of leadership and innovation that shape Indigenous and Crip dramaturgies, but in a whole new way, by bringing together artists from communities that have been historically excluded from mainstream performance ecologies and which have been further siloed into spaces of making that have systematically prevented critical cross-community collaboration. We are dismantling these silos to advance emerging conversations, exploring the conflux of leadership and representation in creation and production as related to indigenous sovereignty and deaf, mad and disability culture in the arts. We are generating a platform for self-determined encounter and exchange where our local bodies of knowledge can be activated. It bears importance to share that this project does not aim to collapse Crip and Indigenous dramaturgies and experiences. The exclusions that our community face emerge from very specific historical, cultural, and political contexts. Further, the ableism, sanism, and autism that the deaf, disabled, and mad artists face, from, face emerge from colonial ways of assigning value and human dignity. We use CRIP to include, to include those who identify as mad, sick, and disabled, as well as those who are deemed disabled by society and or medical institutions, whether or not they themselves accept that term. For example, those for whom deafness is a cultural identity, not a medical condition. We use the word CRIP as a political intervention to turn attention onto and to disrupt as our collaborator Carmen Papalia writes, the disabling conditions that limit a person and or community's agency and potential to thrive. We use indigenous with an acknowledgement of the many complex ways the community, family, belonging, polity, and heritage interact with systems of state recognition. The words crip, and indigenous are both used as shorthands and not intended to generalize or reduce our vast multiplicity of identities, experiences, and affiliations. This project is generously supported by this project is generally supported by Rue and Mia. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to the two of you who have fearlessly managed to continue to organize us for so long. Uh, we were noticing in the texture, Claudia pointed out that you two were not hyper featured in this introductory section. And if it weren't for you two, we would not be doing these meetings as easily as we are. So before I acknowledge the wonderful donors and philanthropy class, um, I would like to acknowledge the members of our community who are making this happen, um, Mia Emir. Uh, and Rude Deslin. Uh, I don't know what your last name is in this moment. Um, 
Oh, yes, George Warren. Thank you, email signatures. Um, okay. Um, this project is also very generously supported by the literary managers and dramaturgs of the arts, Bly Creative Capacity Grant, and the Canada Council for the Arts. Thank you. Huge shout out to our partners at HowlRound, which is live streaming today's event for us. Thank you so much, HowlRound. Um, all right. Uh, Claudia. Indeed. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction. So welcome to everyone who is joining us in this digital space. Um, through this live and interactive digital panel, um, we're bringing together collaborating artists who have been involved in unsettling dramaturgy. And so you're going to get to experience how we work together as well as getting to learn from what we are sharing with each other and with you. Um, so we're today going to be exploring the necessity, importance, complexity, and difficulty of cripping practice in the context of online organizing, creation, and collaboration. So the plan for today's session is this. Uh, we begin with an opening. We begin how we always open by acknowledging the land and having a moment of uh, having a decolonized moment. We begin by um, uh, reviewing how we're going to be working together and then also um, taking a moment to introduce ourselves again to each other as human beings. Um, we will then, following our opening, um, the Unsettling Dramaturgy Creative Collaborators will engage in, ex in an exchange on today's theme for approximately 60 minutes. We'll be speaking from our respective embodied knowledge and practices with an orientation towards expanding collective practice as is relevant to all of the different local ecologies that we are working in. Um, we will then, we will always be taking 10 minute breaks upon the hour. A decolonized practice always has healthy bio breaks. Um, we are very excited to have an Forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, Tiara Young. Um, please correct me if I've gotten that, that name wrong. Tiara, Tiara. Mm, say that again. Tiara. Tiara, thank yeah. you. Tiara thank you. will be digitally, visually recording this event for us. So at various moments during this event, um, um, we will share the visual recording that they're creating. And this will also be visually described um, as well. Um, and then after that, we get to have some exchange with you. So hopefully as this conversation is going on, you are taking notes on your respective devices. Maybe you're on Twitter, hashtagging or adding HowlRound and responding in that way. Um, uh, maybe you're on the Facebook live stream commenting there. Maybe you're at HowlRound commenting there. We want to hear from you. We are excited to interact with you throughout this session. Please share your questions share your reflections, um, and to interact with us during this event, you can use one of the three options. One, message us via WhatsApp. The WhatsApp number is 1-803-323-7638. That number, I believe, is in our other digital spaces on HowlRound and in the Facebook event. You can email us a question at unsettling dramaturgy at gmail.com. That email address is again, unsettlingdramaturgy at gmail.com. Or you can comment on the live stream on the Unsettling Dramaturgy Facebook page. Um, our Unsettling Dramaturgy coordinators, me and Rue, will be checking these accounts throughout the session. So please ask questions, give observations. We really look forward to hearing from you. And then of course, we'll have a beautiful moment of closing at the end. I am now going to be handing the um, a metaphorical microphone back to Lindsay to say a few things about um, accessibility. Thank you. So today's session is being live captioned and ASL American Sign Language interpreted. CART or the live captioning is available on the HowlRound live stream and here https colon backslash backslash r E C A P D dot com backslash W middle slash B F capital D capital P. I believe it's an L and a B. 
small. Um, again, https colon backslash backslash recapd.com backslash w slash bf capital D capital P LB. Uh, ASL interpretation is available on both the Facebook and the HowlRound live streams. We do want to note that ASL English interpretation serves to facilitate communication, but it doesn't constitute an authentic record of the original signed or spoken language. Only the original signed and or spoken language or the revised written transcript is considered authentic. And this is part of our, our considerations and how we practice across, like with cross-disability solidarity. Um, so ASL interpretation and CART live captioning are essential elements of how we've built this event. They're vital and they're indispensable access practices. And they require input from deaf folks and folks who use services, these access practices as well, to do them well. Um, but they're also complex and complicated to navigate in online forums, which points to the limits of the programs and the systems that we're using. The fact that they have not been designed to consider or make space for accessibility across a multiplicity of practices and needs, but they also point to our CRIP commitment to working within and to challenging imperfect systems in order to honor the value that comes from cross-disability solidarity work and community building. And so thank you for that, um, the time and space it takes to do this, this work in imperfect ways. Uh, we're gonna remain in an emergent and a responsive shape throughout today's event, adjusting our pace and the shape of our conversation to reflect the pace and shape of all of our collaborators. We're going to name our access needs at the top of the event while well, in our coming intros. Um, and again, as they arise throughout our time together. Um, and when we do this, you'll see some examples of what we mean by this. Uh, one thing we wanna do is acknowledge that trauma is in the room. It certainly is for me right now. And I imagine it might be for both our co-presenters and for audience members. In doing this, we wanna acknowledge that we all have established practices of care for ourselves that we wanna honor, including those care practices that have been pathologized, but done important work. Um, we invite everyone here from our group and anyone in the audience to take care of yourself in whatever way is necessary. And we also encourage you to let us know if we can support. So it's not all on you to do that work. Everyone is welcome to vocalize, to use technology, to stim, to move around, or to leave and return throughout the event. Also, learning from the disabled artists and organizers of the festival, I want to be with you everywhere in New York. We want to acknowledge those who can't be here and those who can never be here because of inequitable and inaccessible structures and the ways that these bump against our realities of our embodied needs and experiences. So you are welcome and appreciated and an important part of our community. Um, and a recording of this event, event will be available for future viewing through the Unsettling Dramaturgy Facebook page and the HowlRound website. Check. I'm so glad about that last bit that you just said, Lindsay, about this being recorded, because everything you said about that prior is stuff I'm going to just be looking back over again and again. Um, it, it's there's so many aspects that I'm just grateful for. Thank you for including those. Um, so we're now we're going to do uh, our check ins. Yay. Um, so um, for the check ins, we typically will do name pronoun, um, if there's any additional land acknowledgement that you would like to do, a physical description, how you are, uh, access needs, an introduction to some aspect of your work or practice, and what's unsettling about the work we're presently doing right now, and uh, where do we feel or notice that in our body. And um, if you want me to help clarify any of the check-in details, just uh, ask me um, if, you, if you don't have it. Um, in the Google Doc. Um, so is there somebody who would like to go first? 
I will go for, oh, Rue. Yes, please, Rue. Uh, Tanaka, y'all, uh, going first twice. Uh, like I said before, my name is uh, Rue. Please feel free to call me Rue. Um, uh, like I said, I'm a citizen of Kataba Nation. Um, I am sitting in an all white room. Um, I have a pink shirt with some sort of images printed on it. Uh, I have white skin and light brown beard and curly, unruly brown. Um, on the wall behind you, behind me, you see a just a ton of post-it notes which represent all the things I am expecting of myself to get done. Um, the land, I already told you about where I'm calling from, Green Earth Reservation of Catawba Nation, um, down in the southeastern so-called United States. But I wanted to take a minute and tell you what's happening on the land right now. Um, we are fully in spring. Uh, the the eastern red buds have dropped their flowers, and there's lots of beautiful uh, herbaceous plants springing up from the ground, lots of delicious things to eat. Uh, next week is the time to start planting things uh, like tomatoes and peppers and beans in the ground for us. Um, how I'm feeling? Uh, I had a call directly before this webinar that I had timed incorrectly. And so for the last 40 minutes now, I felt very hectic trying to plug in and get settled into uh, how to support support this space. Um, so I, I feel like it's time to just take a breath and feel like we're here and that we have all the time that we need. Um, my accessibility practices, uh, I am watching uh, five different windows at the moment, trying to keep track of all the ways that people might wanna access the space or pose questions. Um, so if I mute my video, it's not because I dislike any of you. It's just because I need to refocus on all the other things uh, that are drawing my attention at the moment. Uh, pronouns, I use he, they, any pronoun that's said with love is fine by me. Um, besides what I just mentioned, I don't have any particular access needs uh, at the moment. And what's unsettling? Um, what's unsettling about the work we're presently with right now where we feel or notice it in the body. Um, I, I, I feel unsettled by the lack of humility in these online presentation spaces, not for myself in particular, but just because in the last year I have seen a lot of um, leadership coming from uh, my colleagues here, uh, my Crip and Deaf and other um, colleagues here who have been developing practices for, for inclusion and access. And I see that suddenly in this moment, everyone wants to run to online spaces and want to romanticize them as being eminently accessible. Um, and so I'm feeling unsettled by that hubris and um, feeling the need for most of this presentation to, to take a step back and, and listen to, to everyone else who is here. So. Uh, hello, thank you, um, and I'll hand it back to our our narrators. Thank you, Rue, and I will now hand it back to somebody else. Who would like to introduce themselves now? Who would like to have a check-in now? This is Jess S. I can go. How's my microphone? I tried a different input. Is it okay? Um, hi, I'm Jess S. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, an additional land acknowledgement. I had my first nettle soup of the season uh, since we last met, and it was incredible. We have a fantastic nettle patch nearby. I'm very grateful for that bounty from the earth. Um, I uh, have tan skin and dark brown eyes with dark brown hair. Uh, I'm wearing a v-neck blouse with a black and white pattern that has um, 
orange and red flowers on it spattered throughout the pattern. Um, I'm in a blue room uh, on a beige couch and there's a mirror uh, reflecting a door um, to, uh, to my side. Um, how I am, I am well, I am at home and safe uh, with my family and I am grateful for that. Um, my access needs, uh, I have a tiny baby in, who is napping in the other room. So I expect to need to feed them in about half an hour and just will need to attend to the tiny human uh, in my house. Um, and so I may come and go uh, with that. Um, I work primarily as a dramaturg on indigenous and new work, um, both in theater, opera and dance, both are, there are three things, um, all in theater, opera and dance. Um, and what's unsettling about work? I, 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 I'll, I'll address the, the feeling part of, I'm feeling an absence in my heart right now because I was supposed to be headed to Banff uh, in the next couple of days to go um, work on a new project uh, with playwright Kim Sanclip Harvey as part of the Indigenous Playwright Circle. There, I had many people that I um, was going to be meeting and convening with in person there. So I am missing, uh, uh, I'm really feeling the, the loss of that uh, in-person convening, but very grateful for convenings like this, uh, where, where we get to be together in this space. Um, check. Thank you. Okay. Um... Who next? Hi, everybody. Um, is it okay if I go? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, it's it's Carmen here. Um, I my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, in terms of description, I have. Uh, I would say, well, I'm wearing a sweater today, gray sweater. I have a wool thing going on, wool pants, a greeny brown color, and then this wool uh, flat cap um, that has sort of like a plaid design on it. Um, uh, I, uh, my skin is olive color, I have dark hair, I have a beard. Um, and yeah, I, I'm enjoying the sunshine that's coming through the window. I've been trying to get outside lately. It's been a little difficult because I do have a vulnerable immune system. Um, so I'm trying to take extra precautions, but not feeling too <laughs> cooped up. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I feel like today, most of my access needs are being taken care of. Um, I have been having sort of like uh, increased pain lately, uh, which is something that I, I uh, have to navigate. Um, so, but I feel like I have what I need here in terms of like pillows and um, heating pads, et cetera. So, um, so that's all good. Um, I, I, I'm a, like a socially engaged artist. I'm usually working in communities with folks. Um, my work focuses on accessibility, usually the conditions of the, my own access. Um, I, I consider myself like a non-visual artist because um, you know I use my non-visual senses as like a primary way of navigating my surroundings. Um, I don't use words like blind or visually impaired to describe myself because I think those those terms like they still come out of a culture that privileges the visual, um, which I often try to resist. Um, and and right now, like because of all this, like like it, it's strange because like I I haven't quite processed like this in, this this moment that we're in right now. Um, I kind of feel frustrated in some ways and then like at ease in other ways. Like I, I feel like, you know, as an artist, I try to figure out like what is urgent right now? Like if I can, if I can do anything as an artist, if it's a wide open space to engage a topic, explore um, a topic, 
um, what is necessary. <laughs> um, and so though that kind of has, has, has really shifted for me in the next uh, last little while, because like a lot of the work that I've been uh, engaged in, you know, I'm planning exhibitions, things that have been like put off for a year now, um, other projects that I'm developing with folks and those like <laughs> making something uh, to put in a public place does not seem urgent right now. So I'm trying to recalibrate what, like why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and, and trying to like re reprioritize things um, right now. Um, and that's kind of, yeah, how I'm feeling some of the frustration comes out of like institutions like con like like so quickly changing their practices, like jumping online, doing things differently, accommodating people's needs in ways that was unthinkable like a month ago. <laughs> and uh, and I am often thinking about what is an institution's response to um, to someone who discloses a need. So um, that's been very interesting. And, and I've heard, you know, from others in the disability community as well, and folks who, you know, often have to engage accommodations um, that, yeah, this is, it's, it's kind of like a welcome change, but also um, a bit frustrating because like a lot of us have been <laughs> practicing uh, for this, this moment, but this moment isn't, isn't, uh, unique because I think we, we plan for, um, you know, uh, our own survival um, uh, uh, most days. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm here, I'm in my bedroom. Uh, you might hear my uh, less than two year old uh, squealing from <laughs> the other room. Uh, we're, we're trying to share space in, in a good way right now, but uh, thanks for being here. Thank you, Carmen. Great to hear from you. Um, uh, who else would like to do an introduction? Uh, excuse me, not an introduction. Who else would like to check in? Mm, Jessica W. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Grant, would you be able to remind me what I'm supposed, like what are the things I'm checking in on? <laughs> Gladly. Um, so name and pronoun. Okay. Um, any additional land acknowledgement? Got it. Uh, physical description. Got it. How you are. <laughs> Great. <laughs> access needs. Perfect. Um, introduction to some aspect of your work. Okay. And what's unsettling about your work. And feel free to ask me at any point to, to name those again. I'm happy to. Thank you so much. Of um, course. <laughs> I'm, I, I have my capacity for holding on to anything in my brain right now is a little bit lower than normal. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Watkin. I also go by Jess um, and I use she, her, they, them pronouns. Um, I am an artist scholar. Um, so that's my title. I'm like, already I've forgotten exactly what I was supposed to be talking about. I'm doing okay. <laughs> Great. Other than, other than forgetting uh, what I'm supposed to be talking about. Oh, physical description. Perfect. Okay. I'm, I'm back on top. Um, I am a white settler. I have white skin, black glasses. I might have blue or green eyes. Um, I have dark hair. It's up in a bun and I am wearing, or light hair. I don't know. I'm blind also. That should be said um, i'm wearing a necklace that says feminist in braille um, and on my wall you might see a pulp fiction poster and you might see a rug that i made i'm not sure what you might be looking at right now but both of those are back there um, i already mentioned i'm from Toronto. i was spending today kind of out not out and about you know none of us are really out and about but i, I left the house today so i'm feeling a little bit welcomed by the fresh air um, i have an apartment with no stairs so i'm feeling a little bit cooped. Um, similarly uh, to Carmen, I'm sharing space with my partner who's currently making dinner, so you might hear little noises from him. Um, what else am I supposed to be talking about my practice? Um, uh, I think you've said how you are. Access needs. Access needs. Um, so I am blind, um, so some of these visual descriptions are helpful for me. Um, I also, and maybe this will be um, part of what I'm unsettled by right now. I'm also, I can't access the chat um, on Zoom, which um, as an artist scholar is all I'm doing right now is Zooming every human ever. 
it feels like so many Zooms um, and I can't read the chat box and that has become a problem in many meetings. It won't become a problem in this meeting because we don't rely heavily on the chat box exclusively, but um, that's something that's really been frustrating for me and infuriating and I'm echoing Carmen's um, kind of like uh, complicated uh, experience of the situation right now because we as as Crips we tend to as disabled folks we tend to ha have a lot of flexibility malleability technically you know technology in a lot of our lives anyway um, but it's funny to watch everybody else come up onto our um, up onto our level <laughs> and then be like oh, but we need to have ASL interpretation and CART and visual descriptions and we can get into this later, but it is kind of, it's a, I don't know, I don't wanna say love hate, but it's a very um, complicated relationship with the way that we've turned to technology. So all my access needs are pretty much met. Um, and then I wanna talk just a moment about my work and um, similar to everyone else, I'm not really doing too much um, public facing work right now other than this, which is great. Um, I'm predominantly an interdisciplinary artist and scholar. I work with textiles. So I'm doing, uh, you might see me knitting throughout the time. I'm trying to figure out a baby blanket right now. Um, I think I have the wrong size of knitting needles, <laughs> which is what I've decided. Um, I, I also am a dramaturg. So I spend a lot of time disability dramaturging. I'm currently the thought resident for Spiderweb Show, and I've been sharing uh, 45 second thoughts for the past week, two weeks, and I'm going to continue for the rest of April. Um, and it's weird to be a thought resident at this time because I'm supposed to be talking about art and the way that, you know, drama. Bless you. See? Bless you again. Um, it's supposed to be um, talking about how dramaturgy um, and theater and disability all come together in performance. And then there's this pandemic happening. So I'm finding a lot of my, um, I'm feeling called uh, in what I'm producing that is public facing to be about joy and to be about discomfort and to be about how we can use models of disability dramaturgy in particular to, to learn a lot from this time. Um, so I've been doing a lot of that feeling. Uh, feeling is true, I meant to say thinking, but also feeling, um, which has been hard work um, for me. Uh, it's helping me process, everything you know the global crisis but it's also difficult so I'm feeling that in my upper back right now um, and I think that's um, indicative of the amount of time I'm crunching over to read the chat box during zooms so I'm not going to crunch over today um, to read the, to the chat box I'm going to sit here and happily knit in front of you and um, yeah I think that's I think that's me check Jessica thank you um, so I want to name that the chat box has been getting used um, for technical issues related to interpreters. Um, and uh, just right now, um, Landon uh, Rue asked that one of the narrators, uh, oh, that I voice a request that we pause while the interpreters switch. Um, so I'm just gonna pause speaking while the interpreters switch. Um, Okay, and I think just going forward, if there are any more uh, things in the chat, um, if any of us who do have access to the chat could just verbalize it as it comes through, um, if that would be uh, I kind of consistent with what, I, what I'm hearing. Um, all right, who's next? Claudia, I see you're unmuted. Would you care to check in? I was unmuting myself partially because I was going to do some of the labor you just did, which I love. Um, but let me introduce myself. My name is Claudia Alec. I'm attempting to slow down my normally incredibly fast rate of speech so that our poor sign language interpreter's fingers don't fly off. Um, I, so my pronouns are they, their, she, hers. You can use those interchangeably. Um, I am sitting in front of a Zoom background, but the Zoom background is a photo of my wall. So it looks like I'm in my room and I am in my room. I'm finding this in a meta way hilarious. I'm really enjoying this. It's really silly. Um, so I'm an African American woman. My hair is uh, black and long braids with purple twists. I'm wearing a dress with musical notes on it. And in that background image is my bookcase and some posters of projects that I work on. The water is life sign from the protests and the ghost light project sign from the protests and the, it's all art and protest. Um, 
And let's see, how am I? Um, I am doing well. All of my access needs are met because we do an access check-in. One of my issues has been with the many digital meetings I attend because I have a body that's incredibly expressive and it's expressing things that I don't mean to be saying to you. It's having a conversation with itself. It's saying, this is incredibly painful. I'm gonna make your muscles move in these random ways which communicates noise or misinformation to folks unless I let them know, don't interpret me doing a thing like this as communication, that's just my body moving. So I really appreciate a moment to check in and say, if I'm making a, a, a mean face or it looks like I'm judging what you're saying, that's me just having a moment of physical pain. There's never, if I'm going to communicate, I communicate with my words. Um, other than that, all of my access needs are met. Um, uh, I am the executive producer of Calling Up Justice. It's a transmedia social justice practice. So this is what I do. I meet with people um, in real life and online to create performances of justice and best practices. And the thing that is unsettling, I'm going to just sh uh, uh, lift up and amplify what two of our other colleagues have already spoken about. I'm a big fan of the hashtag, hashtag disabled and salty AF. Um, I'm, I'm, oh dear, I'm forgetting the name of the woman who uh, created that hashtag. That's, that's bad respect. So I'm going to try and find that and put that in the Twitter. Um, but it really, that hashtag, we've been using it to communicate how so many of us have been fighting for these accessible needs and the second dominant culture needed it suddenly it was it was something that was available to them and yet they are practicing them in ways that are breaking the systems that i need to use just to have like base level functionality um and also they are not using them with the best practices that we've been crafting for so long so i'm so excited to have this conversation to have more deep thoughts with y'all uh check thanks claudia um, let's see, we have a few other folks who haven't checked in yet. Uh, Mia, Lindsay, Andrea, Landon, um, who'd like to go next? I'll go. Um, and me, ha, huh, wild card. Uh, this is Grant, they, them, uh, Grant Miller, um, again, calling from uh, Portland, Oregon, traditional unceded ter ter territory of the Multnomah, Clackamas, Kathlamet, and Kalapuya people, as well as many unnamed others. Um, I am a uh, uh, virtual background. Uh, behind me is a photo of the garden at my house. Uh, her name is Lenore. Um, and I am wearing these big chunky Princess Leia headphones that are sort of gray and silver. I have uh, gray and black hair and I'm wearing a, uh, a black, a short sleeve black jumpsuit that has uh, keyholes and magnets where very difficult to open buttons used to be. And um, let's see, how am I? Um, uh, narrating is, is, uh, it's a bit of a task. My attention keeps like turning to like, like, oh, am I missing something? Um, and so I think I'm, I'm relieved at the flow and tempo that we've arrived at so far. So I'm, I'm feeling that relief and just a lot of comfort to see people. Um, there are, there've just been sort of waves of difficulty um, and ease, you know, feeling a lot of comfort with not having to leave the house, which is a person with chronic pain, uh, is something familiar to me, but culturally, other people not leaving the house uh, somehow makes me feel more a part of something um, in a way. Um, and, um, um, I am, uh, and at the same time, I'm also uh, just noticing kind of the the, the difficulty of um, uh, just being in the house, of having a lot of plans and projects kind of disrupted, and um, just feeling really glad to be here for this. Um, 
access needs include water. I have a, a note, I have a, a sketchbook that uh, I um, just am gonna be looking down writing. Um, so I'm, I am still uh, processing, but uh, I, I write things down as a way of processing information. So um, if it looks like I'm not uh, giving attention or if, if you don't hear uh, audio feedback from me, um, that's probably because I'm, I'm down in my notebook. Um, and I'll probably just stop and take a breath every now and then as a part of my access needs. Um, so my work is, um, uh, I consider myself uh, an experimental performance artist. I do work in dance and theater um, and performance art, social practice. Um, I, my, my most recent project has been kind of put on pause while um, COVID is happening. I was in a residency that got canceled. Um, and so this project is one of the main projects I'm doing right now. Um, I'm also a, an equity consultant in Portland, um, and I do uh, just like works, work on uh, ableism training and um, systems change within arts institutions. Um, and I have a, a couple of applications in, but again, with COVID, I'm not really sure what's going to continue. Uh, I also just do one-on-one -on -one coaching for people who are curious to talk about access. Um, and uh, and you know, commit the financial resources that they have to have those conversations. Um, yeah, and I guess a big part of my work is asking questions about how presence is shared um, in a given circumstance um, and how, how it is that a given performance circumstance can uh, take responsibility or that the people in a given performance circumstance are given the responsibility of looking after one another's care needs and how doing so allows us greater freedoms and greater flexibility um, and greater opportunity to build relationship and to um, participate in the culture that we're in. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll probably say more about that later. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm a part of a collaboration called The Curiosity Paradox with my partner, Jonathan, and um, yeah, thank you, Jonathan Paradox and Grant Miller and Lenore Evermore, the garden here. Okay, uh, thank you. Who's next? I can go next. Um, thank you, Andrew. Hi. I'm Andre Kovic. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And once again, I'm calling from Seattle, Washington, where the sun is shining, which is kind of rare for us, but I'm loving it. Um, physical description, I'm seated in front of a white wall with a bookshelf. Um, I'm a light-skinned female with a purple v-neck shirt and a gray sweater. And um, how am I um, kind of have back-to-back -back Zoom webinars today, so I'm feeling like, OK, this is the second one. Hang on there. And it's a new feeling, but um, as far as access needs, I sometimes get self-conscious about how I don't speak as much as everyone else. So I'll mention that because in this circle, I feel like it's understood, but it's not always understood in other places. Um, so my day job, full-time day job is working as an accessibility consultant in the design construction field. So I'm on the side, I do freelance dramaturgy in theater and um, 
my work is kind of emerging, but I'm trying to meld those ideas of accessible environments into the dramaturgy that I create. And also looking at um, issues of representation and who's getting to tell the story on stage and who's being represented backstage and throughout the process. Um, and my, so my work has looked very differently from like putting together a festival focusing on playwrights who have disabilities to most recently reading new plays for a play festival, um, using my personal and professional lens to look at how disability is being represented in the place, which was an amazing experience actually. And I think more play festivals need to do that, especially when we're having non-disabled playwrights writing disabled characters. Um, so, What's unsettling right now for me is I'm having a hard time focusing on my theater work. Um, more, it's kind of a day-to-day -day thing, but I think that's kind of what everyone is going through. So, um, and that's my check-in. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Lindsay, can we finish? Yes, yes, please. Um, oh, Mia just uh, asked if we can finish check-ins before we break. Um, I was thinking I would go last because I can facilitate the movement, like transition into the movement break um, after my check-in if that works. So maybe Mia or Landon. Splendid. Um, Landon, would you be up to go? There we go. I'm just making sure. Great. And Lad is just saying, sorry, that was my cat was actually on top of my shoulder, leaning back with the tail almost in my face. Anyways, um, I'm just, uh, I want to appreciate uh, being here. My name is Landon. So copy me, my name sign is, it, description is with two fingers you can see if you can copy me in terms of what I'm signing and then do this movement, which is the index finger and the middle finger bent a little bit half, and then it's on towards the eyebrow, just back there. Jessica, I think you got that perfect. Excellent, that looks great. Um, and so my pronouns, I don't actually have any because within the deaf culture, we actually do not include pronouns in our language. What we do is we use reference points to somebody's characteristic, the length of their hair or pointing to who they are, but we don't use pronouns in our language. Currently, I'm on screen with a dark shirt with a uh, cowl neck type of scarf. I have my hair pinned up in the back with a bun. I'm currently situated, seated in my office with a green back wall. Uh, I have two couches um, and then I have one swivel chair that's in the middle, so it's quite fun for me. In terms of my access needs, I have sign language interpreting. I would like to say thanks to both my sign language interpreters. Both of them are contracted under a deaf agency specifically. Um, and I would like to have continuity in using the same interpreters. And so I thank you for that. I have a relationship with the two of these interpreters. Um, they're familiar with terminology and I have a comfort uh, connection that's uh, an established trust with them. One sign I think <coughs> I want to just illustrate is dramaturgy to everyone. Um, so if you can look at the sign dramaturgy. 
And if you do this with your hands, the five hand shapes uh, that's going out to your body and then the dramaturgy is actually graphed like a um, going up in scale. Now, uh, I did teach interpreters in terms of dramaturgy and now we have a new sign that will use dramaturgy for that. So I just wanna clarify that with uh, the interpreters and everyone here. As I recently uh, just said, um, uh, what I'll be talking about really is I've been working on a project with my ASL opera and it has been incredibly challenging. Part of my work is just kind of reconditioning that process, getting ASL recognized, decolonizing the process of English influence and how I do that. And, um, you know, we ran out, we had about 40 deaf people that were involved in my audience. And my particular goal with language is really to integrate with spoken language or with other theater groups or other genres that could work collaboratively with um, both signing in English and also those that are of a deaf audience and the public, the hearing audience. Uh, I am a deaf American Sign Language performer. And I'm not sure if we understood the last comment that I said. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Oh, I think, oh, you're saying it's time for wrap up. Okay, I understand. Oh, 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 now I understand. Sorry, you want to talk about how I'm feeling and what's, uh, what's going on. In my ASL opera uh, moments, it's been very, very challenging, very challenging for hearing people to not understand about deaf culture. And I tend to, you know, hire sign language interpreters. And um, a lot of times within the creative team, we talked about the hearing people are really the ones that need the interpreter, not so much the deaf people. The deaf creative team doesn't need that. And so lots of uh, cross-cultural miscommunication uh, are happening with two groups. And so uh, as our drama team worked together, I made sure that we provided a, an interpreter that could understand both. So again, um, looking at Peter, who's hearing, and everybody else, trying to work through, uh, to work through those uh, moments was quite challenging. When I think about the deaf intern projects and how they feel when they have, uh, how are they impacted as opposed to interpreted theatrical performances? I think there needs to be some thought in terms of that whole process. Um, it's a constant challenge that I face on a day-to-day -day basis and it happens with every performance. You know, how many hearing individuals often act portraying a signed character? And we need to be careful about that because yes, it portrays perhaps accessibility, but then it denies the cultural identity of the deaf person being able to use those signs. So, um, okay, I'm sad because my cat's not on me anymore. I had to put them down. But anyways, this is a great discussion, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, Landon. Um, Mia, uh, are you available to check in? Hi, Mia, she, her, hers, uh, description. Uh, I have dark hair that is growing out wildly that is held somewhat in place with a green headband. I have light skin, dark eyes, uh, full cheeks a gray sweater, a green t-shirt that has diagonal lines. Um, behind me is a white couch, a white dog, a yellow pillow, um, some art on a gray wall. Beside me is my 10 week old baby, um, whose name is Ahmad Solas. And they are wearing a white onesie with um, blue bows printed on it um, and uh, my access needs today are that I am feeling very stretched uh, in my heart and my spirit and my mind and in my home um, and so I am just going to ask for patience as I um, take extra time maybe to pull my parts together. Um, I will be spending most of my attention 
uh, trying to keep an eye on um, any audience engagement that is coming at us from the Facebook live stream and um, from our email address. So really want to encourage people who are joining us today to interact with us in that way. And I will be there to catch you and Rue will be there to catch you on WhatsApp. Um, um, I am uh, like so many of my collaborators here uh, feeling the kind of awe and depthful frustration simultaneously about the ways in which the shape of work in the world has automatically seemed to be able to shift with this new context, uh, even as we have been advocating for these conditions uh, for years. Um, so the ways in which um, abled community is now uh, trying to reorient towards um, uh, modalities of work that are really informed by crypt mad practice um, and uh, and and I'm excited for people to have um, new ways of working and new ways of feeling and sensing and iterating their experiences and I'm also um, deeply troubled by the erasure that happens in moments like these of the long work that people have been doing, that our community communities have been doing to try to establish conditions that are uh, in more um, humane, uh, real, uh, real world shapes, real world, sh world shapes that reflect the real context of our minds and our bodies and our spirits. Um, um, I'm forgetting some things I think about my check-in. Who, who am I? Um, what do I do? Uh, my pronouns. Uh, I did my pronouns. Um, I am the convener and co-coordinator of Unsettling Dramaturgy. Um, my practice uh, spans artistic, creative, and community practice. Um, I'm a writer, creator, performer, dramaturg, uh, sound designer, um, and, and disability justice organizer. Um, I'm a crypt mad Jew of mix, mixed Ashkenazi and Sephardic ascent. Um, and I think that that covers everything about who I am, what I'm bringing here today. Am I right about that, dear narrators? Yeah. Um, yes. Great. Uh, I'll leave it there then. And Thanks, Mia. Yay! Mm -hmm. um, all right, we're going to take a moment to pause to switch interpreters. We're good. All right, um, uh, Lindsay, let would you wrap us up and then shift us into break through a movement exercise? Great. Thank you, everyone. Um, Tiari, I don't know if we want to be introducing you as well. That's the only question I had um, about before I jump in. Um, a, this is pardon? Claudia with a wild interrupting suggestion. How about you introduce yourself, we have our break, and then we get to meet and, and witness and hear about this amazing work. Because I've been seeing drawing taking place. I can't wait to see what this is. But maybe after the break? Love it. Yeah, something that people can look forward to, a reason to come back after break. Who knows what will be on that paper? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, rad. Um, all right, I'm Lindsay Eels. I use she, her, and they and them is wonderful as well. Um, I'm currently in a space where snow is slowly melting, and I have come to find affinity with that in terms of slowly emerging from decomposition and fallow time that happens for me very often in the winter and into early spring um, and time I've that I often feel empty of thought and um, deep of feeling but um, am trying to honor and celebrate um, as important parts of my process. Uh, I have a pale round face with freckles and bright red curly hair. I'm wearing black cat eye glasses that have sparkles on them. Uh, I have a green shirt that's of a forest and a baby sloth necklace on because I'm trying to learn to be slow and honor that as well. 
Um, and in the background, I'm in my bed, so I'm gonna do our warm up from my bed because that's a thing. Um, and in the background, there's a painting or a picture of trees that are coming together with the sun shining through. I'm feeling, I don't really know how I'm feeling. Um, I'll, I'll work into that in a minute. Um, access needs, I tend to move as I need to. Um, I might request that folks repeat something they say if I'm, if I've lost where I am in my thought row thing, thinking st string thing. Um, yeah, my practice uh, began in integrated dance and disability performance and now includes queer mad fat performance. Um, and I use MAD as an umbrella term for social and political and critical and community orientations to so-called mental illness and to psychiatric power. And MAD performance for me involves thinking about experiences of madness as sources of aesthetic generativity um, and points of political intervention. And it, my work in MAD performance has also brought me to think to thinking and being and feeling into mad affirming and disability affirming trauma informed practice in the performing arts, meaning that we can actively attend to trauma and craft art creation spaces to avoid re traumatization and to depathologize mental distress and trauma reactions. Um, and for me, mad and disability affirming trauma-informed practice. Um, considerations are central to gripping process. Um, so I think that one thing that's um, unsettling for me right now is, is the push for productivity and for showing up to a bunch of meetings and for doing all of these things in the midst of trauma. Um, the feeling like, am I ever gonna be able to create anything when I have a frozen trauma brain happening intensely right now, I think. Um, certainly my intimate relationships are made precarious by this particular virus. Um, and so death looms and trauma comes with that. Um, and so um, I think I'm unsettled by the, the feeling or the pressure or the amping up of productivity in the midst of this and, and how do we attend to all of those aspects of trauma that make us freeze or, or flee or fawn or all of the things we might do um, to care for ourselves in the best ways we know how in the context we're in, um, but that are often pathologized. Um, so those are things that are kind of big for me right now. Um, yeah, and one thing we wanted, I think we'll shift into a break right now. Um, one thing we wanted to do is offer an embodied opportunity to do some movement because I think we sit at Zoom and sometimes it's really hard to like be stuck there for a long time feeling like we can't move. So it's a three to five minute thing right now. If you want, your preference is to go take 10 minute break because that feels good. Please do that. Um, anything I offer in this movement break, which will take five minutes and be followed by a bio break for another five minutes, so we can pause and do whatever you need to do. Um, but in this movement break, I encourage you to do whatever works for your own body, um, feel into things that feel good for you and avoid things that don't feel good for you because we don't need to feel bad right now unless you want to feel it and then do that. Sure. Cool. Um, I'm going to do it from uh, in my bed. And it, this, this is a brain dance. It's based off of Anne Green Gilbert's Brain Compatible Dance Education. That's the Creative Dance Center out of Seattle. Um, it's something that I do that I have complex feelings about because it's based on normative neurodevelopmental patterns, which we need to problematize because they make um, targeting disabled folks for non-normativity possible. But also there's a lot of entry points for movement. So I wanna hold both of those things together um, as we do this. Um, so uh, to start, we're just gonna feel into breath and in this, I don't want you to breathe in any particular way other than I will invite you to think or possibly try breathing in more than you might in your everyday life at on 
in usual, um, or just feeling to your breath if that feels okay for you. And the next pattern is just some tactile sensation. So we're just doing some tapping. We can do tapping. We can do brushing or squeezing. There's parts of your body that need a massage. Now's a good time to do that. Brushing can be slow if you want to be calming. It could be quick if you want to be waking up a bit. We're just sensing our body through touch in whatever way feels good for you right now. And then we're gonna focus on core distal movement. So we're gonna get really, really tiny, as tiny as you can get where you are. And then as big as you can get, reach, 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 reach. Expand, take up as much space as you can and bring it back to tiny, tiny, tiny. So we're moving from core to distal, which is big, stretched out wide, taking up lots of space. And maybe a couple of cycles of that on your own time, getting small and big as you'd like. Now we're gonna look at our head and our tail connection. So our head can come closer to our tail in the front space and further apart. It can come closer together in the back space and further apart. Our head and tail can come closer together in the side space and further apart. And we can also think about spirals or snakes or twists. So we're just thinking about how do our head and tail relate through our spine. Great. Now we're gonna move just upper body movement, however you might like. Sometimes that's swingy or flowy. Sometimes it's shaky or vibration. Sometimes it's soft. Sometimes it's close to our body. Sometimes it's far away, the reaches. Thinking about neck, shoulders, ribs, as well as limbs. <coughs> the next part is to move our lower body. So we're moving our lower body whatever we feel comfortable with. This might include moving wheels, moving through space, or just moving, flexing, and extending as you'd like on in place. We're gonna move one half of our body. So we're planting one side of our body and we're moving the other side, however it likes to move. And we'll plant that side, move the other side. We're working on body side work here. And then we'll cross our midline. So we're crossing our body. It's a classic Macarena, if you like it. Crossing our body. You can cross in the back too. Sometimes we forget our back space. Excellent. And the last one is vestibular. So often this, the best one is to spin in circles, but another way you can rock or swing. And we're just getting a little bit dizzy and then finding some equilibrium as we come back and try a different way. All right, we come back to our breath for a couple times. Notice how our body might feel differently from when we started and we take a pause. So we'll be back in about five minutes.
Well, Landon's trying to get your attention. And I don't see him. That's what I'm trying to click on. Uh, I can't see him at all right now. All I see is Grant and you. So just scroll to the bottom. There's a, at the bottom of the, the four images. If you hover over the last one, a uh, tile will show up with the arrow. Uh, uh, Landon's saying that he can see you though. Yeah, okay. I can't see him because what happened is the unsettling dramaturgy break statement came all across my screen, the white screen. Right. Okay, so yeah. hang on, I'm dragging it out. Now I see him, okay. <laughs> Sorry, it's like, who? <laughs> um, uh, this is Claudia, I know we're on a break, but could you just say again exactly what problem you were solving in that moment? Uh, this is Brooke, we were just saying that once the tiles went to the side that we could only see, I could either see Landon or Ava. So the three of us couldn't see each other. So we're just scrolling amongst the participants in order to see each other. Interesting, thank you.
All right. I think it's about time to uh, get back in. Excellent. I just wanted to name some of the beautiful processing that was taking place during our break. Uh, and um, and then we'll be transitioning to get to uh, uh, get to know um, our person who's doing graphic capturing. I would love to know the exact name of what this process is and we'll get to see it. Um, so what I witnessed was when we went to sharing a full screen, um, it made the interpreters be unable to see the, uh, to see Landon, um, to see the person they were trying to communicate with. Um, and then in real time, we talked about it out loud and solved it in real time. That's often what our practices have to be when working with mm -hmm. technology that was not designed to be accessible. Um, to pass the mic to, I feel like I, I should pass the mic to Tierra, whose name I believe I am still mispronouncing, I apologize, to introduce themselves and uh, then we can uh, witness the work and the art. Sound good? Excellent, check. Hello, can you hear me? Great, um, so my name is Tiare. Um, thanks for asking about the pronunciation. It's similar to saying the three letters T-R-A but with a, bit, a bit more fluidity. And um, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm a tan olive skinned person with dark black hair. Um, and I'm wearing a very patterned shirt and I have glasses. Um, I'm also a, a thin person. So I have thin privilege in the world. And how am I? I'm really grateful for the bio break. Sometimes when I'm graphic recording in live meetings, they like go over and I'm like, I have to pee so bad, but I can't run across the stage in the middle of the keynote. OMG. <laughs> so, um, and I'm also just quite grateful to be here with all of you. Um, it's so, um, Access needs, my access needs are met and an introduction to some of my work and practice. So uh, someone is asking the name, there's no right or wrong name for uh, the process I'm doing, but I like probably the most Googleable term is graphic recording. People also use graphic facilitation. And that's just the live process of being really present with a group and um, listening for sort of the key takeaways or some salient points and putting that into a visual format that combines words and images. Um, yeah, so I've had the honor um, of being able to graphic record in settings where people are talking about disability justice and accessibility and I always learn a lot and feel really grateful for that work happening. So I'm super grateful to be supporting or collaborating with this um, series of videos by drawing some visuals. I, I was just um, talking to my younger sister who lives with a chronic illness um, that's undiagnosed, but often during a flare up, she's just stuck at home in bed and, um, yeah, just sort of sharing some of, she was sharing some feelings with me about um, what's happening in this COVID time. And she had just shared that she was like, well, Tiara, like I don't want anyone else to suffer, but honestly, there's a part of me that feels relieved that the rest of the world is forced to move at a pace that I have to move at all the time. And I hope that people have more understanding and more like empathy for what I'm going through um, as I'm often in bed and and can't do a lot of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of stuff she obviously can do. Um, so yeah. Um, maybe I'll just tell you a little bit about um, the drawing before I share it with you. So the 
what I've been doing is I have a notebook beside me and I'm capturing some penciled down notes about some of the like themes that people are commenting on. And I've started to think of the, the images I'll create, like they'll probably be more than one because I don't want to cram too much overwhelming information into one image. Um, and so maybe there's an image that's kind of telling the story of what people are experiencing. So um, talking about what's happened with institutions suddenly jumping online and people's thoughts and emotions in response to that. And I also was thinking maybe there will be another image maybe of someone sitting in bed at their computer um, with some like accessibility best practices as a list um, because I've been jotting down some of those things as I observe people practicing them. For example, access check-ins, acknowledging the land and situating ourselves on it, bio breaks, uh, transparent facilitation, so solving problems as they come up. Um, yeah, and so I just thought I would tell you like that's a separate image um, and then I'll share with you what I have so far and I'm still catching up. Um, I'm just, so the drawings, sometimes I like to draw the drawings first so that it feels engaging and then I figure out the most uh, like succinct way to narrow down the text um, afterwards. So yeah, let me just, let me just share my screen. All right, and just as a reminder to everybody else participating, uh, while you show the image, we are going to just be quiet um, and not speak. And then Lindsay will offer a description uh, after, after you share it. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay. Can everyone see that? It's coming up. Great. Let me know when, I mean, I feel like there's not that much to see yet, so I can take it down. Thank you. Yay, thank you. Um, so maybe I'll just offer some of the things that I noticed to start. And then Terry, if you have things that also you feel like as the designer you want to share, that would be really cool too. Um, I'm excited about learning more about this practice, particularly and the process for it. So um, what I witnessed was a, a picture of um, a land formation. Um, that's what I understood it was up in the left hip top hand corner that had overlaid the text of the name of the praxis session that we are um, participating in. So it said unsettling dramaturgy praxis session and probably missing some words there. And then there was this little green pathway coming from that picture across the top of the page in a squiggly way um, that had some text on it and I forget what it said, cripping practice, I think. And then in just below the land formation picture on the left hand lower side, um, there was a screen, so a laptop, of, uh, an image of a laptop with four video sections with um, different faces um, and a sign language interpreter in one of the corners um, and folks of uh, various gender and uh, race presentations. And um, there was a bill, a small like little uh, drawing, uh, an outline of a building in black and white that was a little bit more center um, and a little higher up on the page, but just under the, the green pathway. And it said institution, next to it, it said institutions are, 
are coming online, something similar to that. And then the rest of the page kind of from the center over down to the right hand lower side was blank. So it's um, ready for more um, ideas and uh, thoughts and sharings to be added is what I felt from the, from the image. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. This is Claudia speaking. I'm going to do our Zoom acknowledgement. I'm going to acknowledge a few more of our uh, practices that we've been doing. And then we're going to transition into a discussion about cripping practice um, in digital space with all of our colleagues. So uh, we want to recognize that Zoom, the platform that we're using to come together today is headquartered in what is now San Jose, California on the traditional lands of the Ohlone and Ta uh, Tamian peoples. Mm. Um, some practices you might notice we have been doing. Some of these are practices in physically embodied meetings that you would do to make them more accessible. Some of these are practices that you need to do to make your digital meetings accessible for everyone. For instance, the practice of saying check at the end of speaking is a practice we created because some people are only able to hear us either because they are only on the phone in conference call mode or because they are a member of the deaf community. So saying check is a way to indicate I'm done speaking, the next person can speak. You'll also note that people have been asking, can you hear me? This is an aspect of the technology being inconsistent and sometimes our volume levels being inconsistent, connectivity being inconsistent, but it's also a great access practice to check in to make sure can you hear me? Can you understand me? Um, prior to this meeting, I just muted myself. Prior to this meeting, we created a script that had some of the language we would be talking about. Our land acknowledgments were already in there. We made that so that our captioners and sign interpreters would have something to reference. So they wouldn't be just having to react off of our voiced text. It also helps us as a collective to be able to manage a complex space when none of us are in the same physically embodied space. So having that document was very, very helpful to us. Um, let's see, we made sure to have a meeting prior to this meeting to practice some of this with each other. Um, Planning beforehand is going to be a very necessary process for creating accessibility. Um, and then of course, if you've noticed, we've been doing some very healthy pacing, um, just pacing ourselves for, for access for all of us. We have a lot of questions that we um, have sourced from everyone and the folks that, as part of this group. Instead of reading all of these amazing questions, I think possibly I'm just gonna start off with the first two and then allow us to continue. Does that sound good to my colleagues? I'm getting facial recognition, people nodding, excellent. Oh, actually that reminds me, I should name one other practice that we've been doing consistently, which is Grant already named this. We voice what's in the chat if that feels necessary. We voice what's in the Google Doc notes if that feels necessary. No information is only voiced or only, visual, uh, only visually accessible. Um, the questions we have to begin are these. What does cripping practice in the context of virtual organizing, creation, and collaboration mean to you, and how is it practiced? And the second question was, how can virtual organizing radically reconstruct power in ways that center crip, mad, sick, and disabled contexts, embodiments, and realities? Where and how have you experienced this happening? What does cripping practice mean to you? How is it practice? How is virtual organizing radically restructuring our powers? Check. Hey, Claudia. Would you mind uh, reading those again? Sure, I sure will. Thank you. I could ask all the questions. They're all just really big and beautiful and have a lot in them. So the first question was, what does cripping practice in the context of virtual organizing mean to you? And how is that practice? What are the ways you are cripping practice in virtual organizing? 
And then the second question was, how can virtual organizing radically restructure power in ways that center crip, mad, sick, and disabled contexts and realities? And then again, the follow-up was where, how, what are some examples that you've experienced of, of this taking place? What does cripping practice mean to you in the context of virtual organizing? And I will also name as part of our practice, we appreciate moments to think and take time to respond. Check. Um, this is Lindsay. Maybe I'll just throw out two uh, things that feel simple, but also important for me. Um, this is the first Zoom meeting I've done from bed um, in the context of all of the Zoom meetings I've had. And there's like all these jokey memes going around about how like a bunch of tops are being bought, but nobody's buying bottoms because everyone's wearing sweatpants and like or pajama pants or whatever and nobody can see your bottoms generally in a zoom meeting so everyone's wearing fancy shirts and and sweatpants um and so like dancing from my bed in my sweatpants feels like and and knowing that this is a space to honor and celebrate that feels like one of the cripping practices of virtual organizing that that is enabled particularly by this group um but that isn't something that i like necessarily feel available or safe in other spaces um so like even just acknowledging that like we're we're in bodies and we're wearing clothes and those clothes have meanings and are safer or less safe to expose in some spaces is is something that's been meaningful for me um this is jessica speaking thank you lindsay um while you were speaking it reminded me a little bit of um, something that Audre Lorde, I, I have, whenever I teach, um, in a lecture, I always start off with a slide, um, of Audre Lorde saying that taking care of myself is an act of personal resistance. Um, and I, I also really heard what you said earlier about this productivity culture. Um, I watched a video yesterday while making dinner of a woman who is a YouTuber who normally works from home giving tips on how to work from home and how she suggested never to work from bed, for example. Um, always get dressed, try do your makeup, blow out your hair. And I was like, all right, okay. Uh, <laughs> some people are doing that. This girl's not, I don't do that anyway on a regular basis. Um, but I thought it was really interesting when we talk about cripping practice and about like cripping my productivity right now is a big part of it like I'm not trying to work at all I'm trying to push back on working the same amount as my colleagues or the people around me and like a friend of mine on the bio break sent me a text and said she had she did no work today and she's feeling really stressed about it and her family is really sick and she can't go visit them and all this stuff and I said but you still did amazing work today so for me my cripping practice has been lifting up people because I work with disabled folks all the time. I am disabled, I'm a disabled dramaturg. And part of my practice is every day is always to be like, okay, how are you doing today? Like this hour and a half long check-in we just did is like, a, I, we do that. <laughs> like rehearsals, meetings, everything is you get an hour to like sit around and, and like hold space for each other and hold each other for whatever you're sitting in. And so I find sometimes with these Zoom meetings time and productivity, both come together and I feel like I'm being pushed against like you know an ocean of trying to go faster do more things be more efficient see more people you know zoom call zoom call zoom call zoom call whereas you know returning back to caring for ourselves and each other is the work right now um yeah. and so yeah sending a text message and saying you did amazing work today you took a bath and went to the grocery store great job um, and that for me is a part of my cripping practice right now and is the way that I'm meaningfully engaging both in my, like with my students, but also with my art and with the, the artists that I'm working with as well. And trying to come from a place of flexible understanding, not assuming anyone is showing up 
air quotes fully ready or air quotes professionally wearing not coming from you know like I and that's kind of where it's coming from me so I'm just playing off of what you just said I think like care is such a huge part of crit practice that like and it's so natural for me that it just comes like of course we'd have ASL interpreters of course we would of course we would have audio like for me anyway and so yeah check um, maybe this is Lindsay, maybe I can just add one thing that that sparked for me too is that one of the least crip spaces or like the least desirable spaces for me is a space where we have to quote unquote leave our shit at the door. Um, and so for me too that like you're you're saying this is an hour and a half check in is like and bringing our stuff like all of our stuff is so yeah that really resonates for me too. Check. This is Claudia. Um, today, a colleague of mine posted on Facebook complaining about a problem that I discovered, I want to say two years ago, when I started to work nationally and primarily using digital interfaces. There is a natural limitation to your ability to be in multiple places at the same time or to travel from space to space. So when I was in a work situation that asked for physically embodied meetings, that organization, they did not care about my health or wellness, but they did understand that it was physically impossible for me to be in two spaces simultaneously or to go directly to one space. There had to be walking time involved and they scheduled with that in mind. Right now, that colonized scheduling process that wants to demand all of your time every single minute is taking place in ways where there's no limitations. So people are feeling the stress of wanting to, being requested to be in meetings back to back to back, sometimes simultaneously, which is requiring them to really get real about what are their priorities. How do you demand your time if the people organizing the meetings are not organizing them in ways that are accessible. Check. Hi there, um, it's Carmen. Uh, so I have a, a two, two things. Uh, one is that what I've been noticing lately in just emailing with folks and like checking in with them about how they're doing, um, I don't know, it seems like this this sort of mo moment opened up this space where people can like disclose about certain things. They can talk about their bodies. They could talk about how they're feeling. People who didn't really do that before. Um, I'm hearing about uh, health conditions that I didn't know about before from other folks that we don't really talk about, how, you know, those health diagnoses. Um, and yeah, so I think I think it's been a space where people feel like they can share about that stuff um, and and tell tell others that they're they're not well, like that they are stressed out, that they are feeling a certain way. Um, that's that's usually uh, uh, what we try to do when we're we're holding like accessible spaces, making a welcoming space where we could we could we don't have to leave our, our stuff at the door. Um, um the other thing too and this came up out of like a unsettling um dramaturgy uh, meeting a couple weeks ago um and we were talking about the classroom and how a lot of like kind of uh learning is going online right now and how that's there's this exciting uh potential in that for um for like the that kind of student teacher like hierarchy dynamic to kind of like flatten a bit and and to become more horizontal so um you know in on an online platform um it's kind of strange for one uh one of the many faces um on on that gallery view to be like talking all the time and so like engagement within a crowd i think people are thinking about more um it, it almost like like it, it yeah i i feel like it it disrupts in some ways the the classroom dynamic um in a way that opens it up a bit um for for others that might not um you know feel comfortable talking um um i think there are just certain conventions to it that that um, that yeah kind of relate to some of the issues with sitting in a classroom in a fixed sort of uh, uh, seat, seating arrangement.
Sorry, check. I'm just listening to the uh, <laughs> the chat. Sorry. <laughs> uh, this is Rue. Um, uh, Rue. Not... Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could could someone just oh, Carmen? Would you be willing to just say a little bit out loud about what the experience of the chat being voiced is, just as a point of additional accessibility talk? Thank you, Rue. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, I could speak to that. So I use like a text to voice uh, screen reader just to like navigate what's going on um, on on my screen. And <laughs> I guess what how it's set up, I don't know if I could change this, but you know, uh, tips are welcome. But um, it basically is set up to read out everything that's going on uh, in, on, on in chat. Oh. Um, just in a robotic voice as if I was like a gamer and wanted to be multitasking and listening to chat while I'm playing a game. Um, it's kind of dis distracting for me, but I understand why that space is, is necessary. So um, I, I kind of like remedy it by just listening in mm -hmm. one, one um, through one headphone, basically. Thank you, thank you, Carmen. Um, yeah, not realizing that that's the experience of chatting uh, for you. Um, I, I do want to I do want to not take up too much space, but I just wanted to input here um, a particular experience that I'm having in this moment um, as someone work, someone from a tribe and working for a tribe um, in the so-called United States is that the United States uh, Congress has allocated a bunch of funding to come down in response to the pandemic. And what's that, what that's translated to for my tribe is that, yes, um, we have a lot of really amazing opportunities coming up to build capacity often around um, access for a lot of our tribal members, particularly ones dealing with um, substance use disorders and um, domestic violence situations um, and homelessness and things like that. But, but in this moment, what it actually looks like is that for that funding is them coming to us and saying, we want you to get this funding. Here's a 50 page application that you need to fill out to receive that funding. And so I am just so inundated at the moment with writing giant grants for funding that they've told us they want to give to us. Um, and I, I'm particularly bitter because all of the rev revenue of the United States is built on land that has been stolen from indigenous communities. So I don't really understand why there has to be a metric for us to give them, uh, for them to give us this money. But but I, I'm just thinking about access and like, we, we're lucky because in the last decade, we've really built up um, capacity and situations for us to be able to pursue those fundings. But I'm thinking about within the last five years, there's been a handful of tribes that have been recognized by the federal government who are eligible for this funding, who don't necessarily have the institutions in place to be able to access support. And so what is that, what is that barrier there that people have to cross to access support? Um, and so I'm, I, I'm just curious about how that, that translates to more personal experiences, this, this tribal experience translating to personal experiences. Check. This is Grant. Um, I think following up a little bit on what Rue, you said, and Carmen, although I think this is a lot of what I'm feeling is threads from what many of us have talked about already um, is related to this question of um, like cripping virtual space. And um, I think about access to resources and the ways that we culturally are, that the labor that we do is connected to how much money we have and that that labor determines whether or not we uh, have access to food, access to healthcare, access to housing, whether or not we are more likely to be put into prison, whether we are more likely to uh, have health disparities. And um, suddenly with COVID, 
um, a lot of people's access to those labor markets um, are completely disrupted. And I think that there is a really powerful opportunity for um, disabled activists to um, to really further the disruption <laughs> and to say, we don't need to put on pants to have a good meeting. Um, I, I, there was an article in the New York Times <laughs> um, that said, um, that was talking about like best practices for having a Zoom conference. And one of them was like, make sure that your kids are put away in the other room or whatever. And for the work that we're doing, um, again, going back to what you had said, yeah, there, there is Mia. What, this would not be what we're doing without you, Mia, um, and, your, and your child, um, and Jessica. Um, this is part of what cripping practice is. Um, going back to Just to you describe the image that I just shared, I'm breastfeeding my child, and that's what I showed. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mia. Um, and that to what you were saying, Lindsay, this idea that, that we have bodies, those bodies exist in a given circumstance and that they have needs that will change what it is that we're doing. Um, our ways of thinking that run counter to colonialism, that run counter to capitalism. And that for me, cripping practice has the potential to to use this moment or that this moment has the potential to use cripping practice to change the way that culture um, prevents our bodies from having access to life um, and having access to, to freedom. Um, and so I guess that like, um, like yeah, to Carmen, you said that there are people who are now suddenly disclosing illnesses that they've never disclosed before. Like what an amazing time that suddenly people feel free enough to talk about our bodies. So I, I feel a very, I feel a lot of empowerment from this group, from other, particularly from digital organizing with disabled people. Um, and that I, I would hope that anybody who is in this conversation who does not self-identify as disabled is happy or is willing to interrupt any Zoom meeting to say, hey, let's do an access check-in. Uh, or you could, you could even say, um, this disabled person I heard or this disabled activist I heard during this conference suggested that we do an access check-in or a land acknowledgement. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I just, I, I, I see the ways that we interrupt normative culture, both in real time and in the ways that we do in order to make sure that we are all participating. Um, that, that, that is how cripping practice manifests for me in digital space. Um, and there, just just as a heads up, there's conversation in the chat about uh, inviting audience questions after the break. Um, so uh, we've, I think we've only had about 40 minutes to talk. We have a break scheduled for right now. Um, I'm curious how people, are there any other like closing thoughts before we shift into a break? Um, I know that, uh, let's see, uh, just gonna name uh, Andrea, Jessica, uh, Landon, as people who haven't spoken yet, just giving you an opportunity. I see head shakes. Is there anybody else who wants to make sure that they uh, add something before we go into break? Yeah, I'd like to chime in. This is Andrea. Um, I find that when you're in a crit space that's really a crit space, words keep coming up like understanding and supporting. And all these words that are just love. And that's what crit spaces are to me. And crit practice is taking care of each other, recognizing realities. And I think that we just need to bring crit practices into all practices. So, awesome, thank you. Uh, 
Yeah, well, um, uh, I, I, again, I feel like I'm repeating things that people have already said several times with great intelligence, but I am going to name them um, with a title. So I began doing something that I called decolonizing my meetings. And some of that was, I begin by asking people like, how are you as a human being? Before we transition into like, this is the work stuff that we're doing. Um, having a meeting practice that allowed people to take care of their human bodies. Like you don't have to ask me for permission to leave the meeting space to take care of your human body. That's, why would I do? I don't, I don't create meetings that require you to like hurt yourself to participate in my meetings. I call that decolonizing colonizing my meeting practice. Today, I am calling that relaxed meeting style. Relaxed performances, that's a way to title performances that are, have the highest level of accessibility to everyone in a theater space. They were created specifically to serve uh, the neuro neurodivergent community. Um, and, but I find that I've been producing relaxed performances my entire life because I like to have an audience that maybe has some children in it and they need relaxed spaces. So I would like to honor our relaxed meeting practice. It's one that is necessary when your meetings are taking place inside your home, where reproductive labor and home labor and commercial labor and that money labor all mix together. In this moment, I would like to pass the microphone back to Grant. No, actually, let me say one more thing. Doing digital meetings is different than meeting IRL in meet space. In a regular meeting, when you're talking to a group of people, your body will naturally turn to them and move. You will move your body in different ways. You're not like this. You're not locked in like this. So just wanted to do a shout out for any kind of stretches, embodiment exercises, or just reminders that it's okay to stand up or move your body from my colleagues. That is a beautiful point of access. I now pass the microphone back to Grant to usher us into our break. Thank you, Claudia. Um, we have one more minute before 405, which is a nice round number. Any other, any other last things that people say before we do a shift? Can I just add one tiny thing? Please. Like two sentences. This is just- Yes. Um, crit practice is joyful as well. Like we find joy in failure and mistakes and bumbling and looking at someone's chin on a Zoom meeting and unpolishedness. Yeah, bring me the chin. Um, so I just want to bring that. I think that's a, a way to wrap this all up is that the fact that we've had to negotiate, that we narrate, that we have different things, that it's all crit practice. Like we're not trying to polish this video call right now. Um, because that's, what does polish mean? <laughs> the academic in me is like, what does that word mean? Um, it doesn't fit into my vocabulary. Check. Thank you. All right, so um, we're gonna shift into break. Uh, I'm gonna lead us through uh, an embodiment exercise and I see a finger from Rue, Rue. Yes, thank you. Um, excited for the embodiment exercise and the bio break. Uh, just a uh, access note for our um, presenters is if you are leaving for your break, either before or after the, the, the movement exercise, please go ahead and mute your video if you're able. Um, that we're hoping will help with the transition uh, for our interpreters um, as we as we go into break. So so if you need to leave now, go ahead and mute your audio and video. Um, and if you want to move, uh, leave after the movement part, uh, mute your audio and video after the movement part. Check. And if you don't mute yourself, this is Mia. I will mute you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Mia. Um, all right. So um, wherever you are. Um, this is, this is both for the people who are in the facility or who are collaborators here. And for those of you uh, witnessing from wherever else you are through the live stream, um, I'm going to probably be speaking a little bit to both in different ways because um, I can encounter the people on the Zoom meeting a little differently. So um, wherever you are, just turn, allow your attention to shift to just the world of sensation. 
<sighs> Maybe noticing feeling of breath, temperatures, weight, weight of your body. And as you turn your attention to just sort of the sensing, sensing place, just allow your body to sort of move in whatever way feels comfortable, pleasurable. This might change the way you sense. Notice what you're sensing through. Could it be touch, taste, smell? <sighs> and notice the places, notice the places that might want a little bit of extra attention. Notice the places that are saying, oh, I've been doing this for two hours, what are you doing to me? Or maybe the lower back has something to say. Notice if they, they have anything else that they wanna, any ways that they want you to move. For this last minute, before we get into a more quiet break, I want to just invite the prompt of moving with awkward fabulosity. Really just allow your body to move in whatever ways feel both awkward and fabulous. How can you really just let that, that sense of having this clunky, mushy body that feels so fabulous and just share that share that with yourself in whatever tiny or enormous way you want to uh, through the breath through movement through a tilt of the head <sighs> and feel free to carry this into the next five minutes of break Thank you.
Hi, this is Mia. Just uh, wanting to ask our uh, ASL interpreters if you can look at the chat in a second. I'm going to just type something in there. Brooke, can you see the chat? Because I can't see the chat. Yeah, I can see the chat, Mia. Thanks for checking in. Yeah, we initially we did start interpreting it. Uh, I asked London if you wanted to keep going. Uh, let's chat in it. the chat. Brooke, let's sure. chat in the chat itself. Hi there, Mia, it's Ava here, one of the interpreters. I've just been um, just discussing to Landon and he's asked me to respond. Um, what we were doing, which wasn't interpreted is, there was um, terminology and vocabulary coming up on the chat. Um, and one of the words was microaggressions. We don't have a particular sign for that in American Sign Language. And so Landon was discussing with the two of us what could we use for that contextual uh, concept in sign language that would make it easier for us to use it both ways, not only us watching Landon present, but also if uh, we're interpreting from English to ASL. Uh, so that's what we were doing. So our apologies for not, uh, our apologies for not letting you know that. Um, and, and thank you for reminding us if you've seen us that, that we need to, uh, to let you know. Um, also too, with Landon, we, we can't shut our screens off because then we can't communicate with Landon. So we will always be live. <laughs> so uh, please gently remind us that you can see us and if you wanna be part of our conversation or, or at least hear it, we'll make sure that one of us that's interpreting uh, can 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 let you know that so my well our, our our deepest apologies for that that was a complete oversight on our part that you could see us but that we were actually dialoguing about how to how to framework that particular word of microaggressions that's 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 really um awesome to know and just wanted to make sure that um what grant was leading was also being interpreted because that was still part of the public work that we were doing. So just had some concern around um, multiple things happening at the same time that might have been cre creating some confusion. Um, but we're, we're totally live and I think we're back now. So I'm going to hand it over to our, um, our narrative. Hey, this is Claudia. I just want to say as part of the point of this very specific gathering, being allowed to witness the in real time process of figuring out how to communicate with the best access processes is just great. So I want to thank Mia, as well as Ava, as well as Landon. I'm not sure who else was involved in that exchange, but thank you to everyone. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, Can I just uh, insert myself here? <laughs> um, I, I, would, I look forward to maybe us having a conversation prior to our next meeting about how to facilitate that even better so that if the interpreters um, need to have a more private space during breaks, um, how we might be able to make that happen. Uh, so just putting nice. that out there, uh, thank you. 
Thank you so much, Rue. And uh, I, as I always have to remind myself, the practices that we do to meet, those are practices that were perfected by colonialism and bureaucracy for many, many, many years, and we inherited them. So now we get to change them, but that changing takes time and process. This is a process. Thank you. We have several questions from audience members that I would love to be able to honor in this final hour. And then perhaps we can close out with maybe experiencing some graphic design. Does that sound good to you, my colleagues? I am seeing visual affor affirmation, head nods and arm shakes. Thank you. So the first question is from Chase. Just gonna get back to this question. Mm. Um, what was the co-creation process for the questions asked each participant in that spectacular check-in in terms of what questions or requests were chosen to be included or not included in that sharing? That's the first question. Check. So just as a more uh, logistical answer to that question, um, the questions that we asked during our check-in, uh, I'm going to read when I find them and I'm speaking slowly to do it. The questions were for people to say their name, their pronoun, give a land acknowledgement, a physical description, how you are, access needs, introduction to some aspect of your work and practice, and what's unsettling about work we're presently with right now and where we feel and notice it in our body. So um, those, are the, those are the questions that this person was curious about. What is the process that we used to come up with those? This is Rue again, sorry to keep interrupting. Um, I just wanna name that these are the exact same questions that we use in our private, um, our private uh, gatherings and so my goal and Mia's goal, and I feel like a lot of our goals was just to live that practice publicly um, to show to show what we're working on together in a more intimate space. Check. Is there anyone else that would like to weigh in on that particular introduction, why we do it, how that was created? Maybe I can just um, throw in something that I really like about the breadth of questions is that to me, the whole thing is an access um, check in, even though we ask specifically about access. But just to just to highlight which many, many of you may already um, know, but just to highlight the the idea of visual, physical descriptions and how you are, are all like trying to get to the fact that there's this really big multiplicity of accesses that we're trying to really hold and support and i really love what andrea said about love and like the idea of this of this being a practice of love storying um is like yeah and and just that all of those questions are i think i'm assuming it's particularly from rue and mia in, in crafting them in relation to everybody that it's about like really acknowledging that multiplicity of access it, it's Carmen. Um, I also want to say too that it, it really was a space that Mia and Rue modeled for us in some ways and invited us into. And it's like a reflection of their each of their practices, I think, in some ways, based on like the language that was chosen for the invitation that we all got to, to participate in these uh, private events together. Um, and, and I thought, I think it also resonates with a lot of like uh, practices that are, are common within more like grassroots spaces that orga organize around, um, you know, accessibility, um, safe space. Uh, they're, yeah, th these are like access, <laughs> they're accessibility practices. Um, and, and I think they really do speak to the, the work and, and the space that, that both me and Ru uh, are, are dedicated to. Check. Thank you, Carmen. Ru, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we, we had an idea, me and I coming into this about what those questions might be. And, and they 
have really flourished in communication with all of our collaborators here. And, and building off what Lindsay was saying, like what I love about them is that they seek to disentangle, as Claudia was saying, the expectations um, of what you're coming into the space with. And, and I think that the hope is always that, that through the series of questions and responses that we're able to, to disintegrate some of the colonial and ableist expectations of, of what it means to show up in a space and, and, and demonstrate through that question and asking um, that we're that we're here for the fullness of the being, right? Like, um, that is the entirety of what I had to say. Check. <laughs> this is me. I just want to jump on that because I think it's one thing to have um, architected a, a list of questions, but the the importance is how are those questions being activated in the space that we're creating? So are we asking truly to listen, to hear, to witness, to um, develop um, um, an interwoven space of uh, mutual aid and care? And how is that then shaping the rest of the time that we're spending together? So when we ask those questions at the top of any convening, how do those questions really get held as we're answering them? And then how do they, um, how do those answers get welcomed as an opportunity to reorient whatever we may have planned for the day? How do we uh, embody a kind of uh, responsiveness um, rather than staying fixed and stuck to whatever agenda or goal or idea of what should be accomplished um, is. And then that to me is truly an embodiment of cripping practice because it is about us being in responsive relationship. Uh, and both of those uh, words are very important, responsive and relationship. You cannot have a crypt practice that is not relational. That is, that is without relationship um, and that is without um, an immediate and constant reevaluation of what we're doing and how and why and where and when and with whom and et cetera, et cetera. So I think like, um, yeah, those questions are come from Rue and I and have been shaped and nourished by this entire group. And uh, really what is special and what is important is how this group uh, welcomes and embodies um, the uh, a notion of how we uh, attend to the time it takes to hear one another, to be with one another, and how those questions invite a reorientation of time itself, a cripping of time or a decolonization of time. So all of that time that we took to check in in the beginning um, really uh, is, is how we're trying to model um, what those questions mean in an activated state. Questions, are, words are empty without the action that is um, invited by them, uh, the possibility that's invited. And so I think that that's, um, it's less about the, the questions themselves and how they, how they are lived into um, as a way of being, as a cosmology even, yeah. Uh, this is Claudia. I also want to do a shout out for the um, the design aesthetic for the entire meeting. So the creation of how do we meet? What is that introduction like? I'm not sure if an access check-in was actually part of the original aspect. I think that was entered into that in our first meeting because the access check-in is a practice that Grant created and then I have been aggressively pushing for every single meeting I'm a part of. Um, so I just want to say just a shout out to the the way you scheduled it as well. The fact that our meetings are scheduled to be three hours long. That means something that is a radical act in and of itself. Um, it, by by claiming that amount of time, it actually allows us to be human beings that aren't um, trying to be capitalist machines and make the meaning really, really fast. I believe these responses spoke to Chase's second question, but I'm going to voice that question and share it with you now, which is, how would folks speak to those of us wanting to create, hold, and prioritize these sorts of radical, crypt-centered spaces? Any wisdom to share and how to co-create these spaces or conversations in a dedicated way such as this, but also in an ongoing daily way? And he and Chase also, I don't know Chase's gender pronouns, so Chase also shares a thanks for the lovely movement practice. Check. Um, 
I want to use that phrase responsive relationship again and again and again. Um, and I, Mia, I really love the way that you talk about the questions themselves not being the thing, but those the way those questions are activated towards responsive relationship as feeling so fruitful and so core to the to the work that is happening here. Um, often I've, I've seen institutions start to adopt accessibility practices, um, but they look and feel um, very constrictive. It's like, we are making you feel access now. Here are the captions and your comfortable space is there. Um, and they don't tell you where the comfortable space is. Um, they don't ask you how you're doing. Um, uh, they don't want to be asked how they're doing because they're way over threshold because they're rushing to uphold these capitalist paradigms. And so um, this, this idea that, that part of doing these check-ins is, is for me about, um, about welcoming the reality of our bodies on this land um, into the space rather than trying to perform the illusions of capitalism or per perform the culture of white capitalist culture that says we have to be a certain way in order to be allowed to engage. Um, if, we do, if, if we don't want to engage in this way, we have to have a very good reason for it. If we want to move our bodies in a way that don't look like machines, we have to have a very good reason for it. Um, and if, if we don't have a reason that isn't perfectly justifiable, then we're pushed out of those spaces. Um, responsive relationality or spaces of re responsive relationship um, are actually about arriving as we are, for me, um, and using, using the space of check-in, using this time to really feel our bodies with one another in a time of ecological collapse and right now in a time of quarantine. Um, and that anything any time or space that takes us away from that um, really risks reiterating this culture of this culture that disabled that actively disables us. This culture that causes us to hurt our bodies in order to uphold the capital, in order to uphold uh, people who have more money than us. Um, check. My brain processes so quickly, so it is an extreme effort for me to hold and create space for others to respond. That was fire! Thank you. That was that was beautiful. I love all of you human beings sharing your really smart, useful ideas right now. I'm going to move us to the to a third question, but that second question was really uh, productive. So if we want to return to it, we have time. The third question we received via Facebook Live from Beatrice is, I am very interested in how to deal with microaggressions in a virtual facilitations slash meetings. I kind of wish that we could dialogue a little bit with Beatrice to find out maybe a little bit more about what types of microaggressions they're uh, referring to or experiencing. But I feel like we have all been doing a lot of meetings with people who do not have competencies in either accessible practice or even just digital meeting practice. So maybe some of us can speak to that. Um, so yeah, has anyone had to deal with microaggressions in virtual facilitation meetings at all? Colleagues, before I before I speak to it, anyone else? Claudia, I feel like this is fully in your warehouse as someone who is doing so much digital facilitation. So I'm particularly curious about what you have to say about those. But uh, <laughs> sure, I'm happy to speak on this. Um, so I uh, the harassments and the microaggressions that we receive in regular space, we receive them in digital space all the time. So you know, we have this entire uh, conversation about Zoom bombing. And I had to explain to someone that's not new. 
Like I've had people crash my event on multiple occasions. I've done my beautiful public Martin Luther King Day celebration and had someone who felt they needed to drive around and honk their horn and yell the N word. That's what we are dealing with. In a digital space, there are some different parameters to think about. In, in a shared physical space, I have a lot more access to using body language or nonverbals to communicate with others, to request support, um, or to interrupt what is happening. You can always interrupt what is happening, however. So if someone does a perfectly legible uh, microaggression that you have experienced, such as um, saying, oh, where are you from? If someone has an accent or one of those, you can still interrupt the meeting. The digital meeting sometimes feels like it's more formal and is requesting you to not interrupt. There are also sometimes the issues of the person who's facilitating or hosting the meeting having really strict controls and not allowing you to interrupt. But you can always interrupt. You can you can call out something in the uh, chat function. You can uh, do a visual signal to say, I, I, I can't continue until we address this moment. Um, it's not fair that the person who receives the microaggression is often the person who has to say something, but you also have permission to leave the space and leave the meeting. That's one thing that the digital meeting space does allow for in really beautiful ways. Um, there are some issues around safety and blocking that just have not been acknowledged or dealt with, with platforms such as Slack, such as, uh, well, even with Facebook and Twitter, but, but I'm thinking primarily of Slack and Zoom. Um, if you're receiving microaggressions or harassment in a private chat, that will be visible once the meeting is over. All of that is published and everybody can see it, or at least the person who's hosting the meeting can see all of that. Um, if you're receiving uh, microaggressions or harassment in a Slack format, screen cap. People are publishing what they're doing, that's useful. So you can report. So all of the things that you can do in physically embodied harassment, you can also do in a digital space. Um, does anyone else have thoughts, ideas, reflections on that question? Check. Yeah, I mean, I just wanted to introduce another problem. One is uh, wherein um, owners of digital spaces, let's say pages on Facebook, can go in and delete and modify and redact comments that have been made. Um, and the way in which, for example, I as a co-moderator on this Zoom today have the power to mute, to remove uh, any of you and, and, and the ways in which that then can reify some of these um, systemic issues that we confront off of the digital landscape and on the digital landscape. So um, while we have, you know, while everything that you said, Claudia, is so, so real, I, there are also these problems of, of power and control that still exist inside of the digital space. And so, you know, if a moderator is being called out as perpetrating micro or macro aggressions, uh, the ways in which accountability um, can be sought and, um, and found, I think are still quite problematic uh, in this landscape. And I, and I don't have the answers to that. Um, I have only questions. Um, and, and so I pose this problem maybe as an opportunity for somebody who has uh, experienced something of this to kind of respond to, to how, how, do we, how do we assert accountability? How do we address um, micro and macro aggressions when there is a differential in power and access in the, in the landscape of the virtual space? Um, and how, how do we crip our responses? Or how, what does a crip response to that? Um, kind of event look like? I'm also like maybe just to, to add or I don't know, um, curious about like in, in relation to the question um, about what micro affirmations look like then too, because we talk about like, okay, like here's the micro aggressions, but like we also get like Claudia was saying to be like, yay for things that like need to be amplified or to send 
to send private emails or texts so that they're not recorded, that are not putting people at risk who are, were the targets of microaggression, but to still say, I'm here for you and that was messed up or like, how, do, how can I go forward in ensuring that this doesn't happen again or that kind of, the, the practices of affirmation that we can be amplifying. And what, what are those practices particularly in virtual space, if we're also like trying to address the aggressions, what are the, what do the affirmations look like too? Um, I don't have many answers for that, but I'm, I'm curious about, about it, at, it as a way of addressing microaggressions and, and macroaggressions. Um, oh, Carmen, please. Oh, it, oh hi, Carmen here. Um, I was going to say too that, um, and this kind of goes back to those that that kind of like access check in and land acknowledgement practice. That like for me that the, those that shared set of agreements or or um, to kind of let, like elect into um, a, a collectively held space is sort of like you know setting the tone of of the space and it's also like a, it speaks to the culture of the group that you're convening um and i i think that that can build over time and strengthen over time and 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 folks can and bring new practices into those spaces but like your accessible space is always going to reflect the the needs the politics the um you know the barriers of their various things that the people who are are present at the time are are experiencing and and bring to that meeting um i think it's 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 exciting that we get to model those spaces together and and i think we do online and offline um but yeah that's that's the big thing i think uh, is is really establishing like an an accessible and open sort of culture um uh, for your gatherings um and and knowing that um yeah like it can it can start with that set of agreements that people are all all sort of like electing um uh, into uh together check one of the gifts of this dis this time of disruption is that it allows us to surface what is implicit because we now need to revisit how are we doing these things what are the rules what what's allowed what's not allowed so it gives you an opportunity to perhaps interrupt a power structure that already exists you know for instance that meeting that's always had the same introduction this gives you an opportunity to say we're meeting online can we actually introduce ourselves in this way instead we're meeting online what do i do if this happens and then you force the entire room to have a conversation about what if this harassment happens this is what can take place i'm going to take a moment now. yes <laughs> I take a moment now to acknowledge that while our relationships with time are often kind of constrained with a colonialist construct, our relationships with time with this group and with HowlRound are relationships of consent and generosity and sharing, which means in exactly 19 minutes, this digital space will be shared with others and we will have to go some other place. We had a lot of gorgeous questions that were um, put into this thing and I'm going to read one of them out loud. I think we have responded to it. Working virtually can replicate and amplify the time signature of capitalism. How does centering crip embodiments and practices provide a critical intervention against this? Where and how have you seen and experienced this happening? What has been the impact? Um, I don't wanna be talking so much, but there's so many good questions here and the way they're stated are useful. So I ask my colleagues, should I keep reading your amazing questions or should we just close this out with everybody saying one, like one, one final closing statement and us experiencing the visual, um, the graphic recording? Could we ask one more question, have one response to that one question, and then do the um, other elements that you just proposed, Claudia? Would that be okay? That sounds excellent, and I apologize for reading too fast. Mia, what is the one question that we could respond to, or Ru? Well, I had um, 
just for transparency, I posted this one up in the chat. This may not be the most compelling one. Um, I feel like we did talk to this idea of time signatures being disrupted. Uh, so I'm curious, this was the one that I thought we might wanna just have one answer to. How do digital and web-based platforms make possible practices that reflect a multiplicity of embodiments and ways of thinking and perceiving the world? How are they insufficient? and what innovations are needed? And where are we seeing innovation happening? Because um, innovation is happening, it's been happening from inside of our CRIP communities. So um, yeah, I, that was one of the questions that I was excited to hear folks speak into, um, if yeah. others feel excited as well. Could we, could we spend five minutes responding to that, please? Uh, just kind of what Claudia had said a moment ago, um, since so much of how people are communicating is shifting onto this new platform, a lot of what is implicit or the way things just are suddenly don't have to be, and we can change that. And that to me is one of the really potent powers of web-based platforms, particularly right now. Because like last night, I attended a Passover dinner um, that I could walk away from the camera. Um, I could uh, do Passover from my bed. Um, I, could, um, I could blow my nose and nobody would mind. And I could make gross noises that were fun for me to make and nobody cared and I could drink wine and embarrass myself um, from the comfort of my own bed uh, while also encountering family friends. Um, and to me, this idea that we can work from a space that allows us our comforts, um, granted I'm speaking from a place of privilege of being housed and having access to internet and computer, um, that I do think that this kind of space can allow for a massive shift for people to really relocate how their bodies encounter the work that they are gonna be doing um, that is completely different from uh, approaches that have existed or approaches that already exist. Would anyone else like to weigh in? I think one of the things that we have been doing collectively, this is Mia speaking, um, has been really trying to introduce ways of being embodied and uh, welcoming multiple ways of thinking into our convening. I do feel that even in our space, we're still, um, intellect centric in centric in a very specific way. Um, and I feel that this medium really lends itself to that kind of um, mode of connecting. Uh, so part of it, I think, is around pace of exchange and welcoming in um, opportunities to respond in ways that are um, uh, maybe more foreign to this kind of mode of communication. So quiet ways of responding in our bodies that may be private, that may not be public, they may not be perceivable by others um, with whom we're gathering. Um, finding ways to make meaning of those forms of communication when we're so far from each other or we are close to each other, but because we're unable to see each other and be with each other in shared space, we are so far from each other. So I think um, this question of how to like somatize uh, a virtual practice is something that is feeling really hot for me. Um, and, uh, and a question that I, I have an ongoing uh, wrestle with. Um, and so I love that, you know, uh, Lindsay and Grant modeled ways that we can um, be embodied. And I'm interested in how can we merge our embodiment inside of conversations, even like this? Um, 
And so for me, that's, that is about like, how do we prioritize multiple ways of thinking and perceiving? Um, which I don't, I, I don't feel that I have the answer to, but it's something that I am longing towards. And, uh, and, I, and I feel that the question is being answered in other people's practice um, that I get to like witness and, and be part of sometimes, um, which is wonderful. But yeah, I, I think this, this medium is, um, it feels like it's still locked in a very specific form of intellectualization. So that's, that's my non-answer. Just a um, request is that maybe we go ahead and move into our closing statements um, since we have about 11 minutes left and we definitely wanna see the beautiful visualization that was created from this conversation. So, just for facilitation purposes, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you my like uh, closing thoughts on this. I think every time coming up to one of these public engagements, I'm a little bit racked with anxiety and pressure. Um, not necessarily because I feel like I have to do it alone because I have such great support with Mia and then with our incredible narrators who've been doing a great job today, Claudia and Lindsay and Grant. Um, but just that's how my anxiety works. Um, I want to state that what I was hearing a lot of responses about were about about the record and and how digital spaces create records and and what that might mean for holding people accountable and also contrasting that with the movement in the United States for getting police officers to record have cameras on their person to record interactions and the ways that that has not led to any sort of accountability. And so I'm curious about in this moment of transition, um, how, how we might um, activate the record for, for justice and for uh, accountability. Um, I'm also thinking about how I got a citation from my tribal housing department last year because I let this vine grow up over my porch. It's called a blaspheme vine uh, because it has lots of thorns on it. And if you get stuck in it, you're gonna blaspheme or curse a lot. Um, I didn't wanna take it down, one, cause I am just lazy and I don't wanna do it. And two, cause I thought it was cool. Um, and now I am gifted with a bunch of beautiful um, sprouts from this vine that are delicious and edible. And so in my body, I'm feeling very hungry and I'm excited to go and um, saute up some of these vines that I did not take down last year, despite that I have a record with my tribal housing department for not having take it, taken it down. So um, that's, that's where I am at this very moment. Uh, thank you all for just a wonderful, wonderful conversation. I wonder if as a way to um, just move our closing, um, Lindsay, you had proposed that we, um, uh, so last time we did just one word of thought or feeling about what we said, any other finishing words, we just have nine minutes left, but Lindsay, following with what Mia said, you also proposed uh, that if we wanted to just do a movement or gesture or sound instead of a word for what we're feeling from today, um, that we could do that to close. Um, Great, I just wanna um, flag, uh, Mia had just asked in the, in the chat about whether we could do TRA first so that we can make sure we describe um, their work and then we can do the quick word movement gesture. Um, I love this. Let's do it. Um, TRA, is, are you ready to share your work with us in this moment? We are excited to experience it. All right. So we're going to be silent as we screen share and witness TRA's work. Uh, it, it, unless Tiara wants to give us a preference, preface, um, and then we will um, pause, audio caption, and then close out. All right. Yeah, um, I'll give you a pretty brief preface 
which is just that um, um, a lot of the insights are like things that people were sharing about colonized time and forcing oneself to be productive. Um, I just wanted to resonate with that and say that some of my best work and drawing comes when I don't rush myself in a panic to be like, write down everything, draw everything. And I really um, allow myself to move at a pace that my own body is not panicking um, because then the imagery really comes together in a beautiful way. Um, for example, as you will soon see uh, an image of someone breastfeeding while on camera and another image of someone in their boxers sitting in bed. Um, and then it allows the thoughts to precipitate um, from an overwhelming amount of information to, oh, here are the key themes. Here are some of those best love practices. Um, and I'm, I don't have the text for this image yet. I'm gonna be drawing that in and catching up in a bit, but I just wanted to let you know um, some of what is gonna be said around here, which is, Um, that these love practices or decolonizing and cripping practices are really about caring for each other, um, asking each other, how are you? Um, and recognizing the way that um, a culture that disables trickles into the online spaces and asks us to do things that hurt our bodies. So for example, um, demanding people be in back-to-back -back Zoom meetings um, and just wanting to create space for the moment of collective trauma that we're all in and the frozen response um, and the need for slowness and rest um, that people are in as opposed to a push for productivity and a push for um, doing as much as you can in this, in this other space. And then, um, what 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 is the what is the the balm or the salve or maybe a more loving response than that push for productivity is a responsive relationship. So that looks like transparent facilitation. It looks like showing up comfortably. Um, and I've already listed some of the other things I'm going to include. So I'm just going to show you the image. Boop, 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 boop. Share. Am I doing it? Not yet. I'm not doing it yet. Uh. Ah, there we go. Brock, can you, sorry, the, just the interpreter's interrupting because we're, Landon and I are trying to get your attention. Oh, sorry, I can't see you. Okay. Um, we were just going to describe to you what was there because you can't see what's being uh, on the screen. Should I stop screen share now? Um, yes. Uh, yeah, yes, please stop uh, screen share. Sorry, sorry. Thank you. Uh, we have about three minutes left with our time together. Uh, we would like to make take a moment to describe what was seen. Um, Lindsay had been doing that. Does Lindsay want to take a moment or um, do I feel probably... like TRA kind of described it before it was shown? Hey, y'all, just interrupting um, from a moderator perspective. 
we we do have 15 additional minutes of time. Uh, I'm gonna say Tiare described um, for me what was in the image. Um, and also I'm really overwhelmed. And so that was that was like really, yeah, a lot to take in and I'm really grateful, but I don't got a word, I got no like, words, what? <laughs> no problem. No problem. And thank you, uh, Rue and HowlRound for the uh, the gift of having time to breathe and close out with grace. Uh, I do want to honor the suggestion from Grant and Lindsay that we each just say a word and a movement. Was that the invitation? A word and a movement that kind of sums up. Um, and it can be a couple of words. We're not overly prescriptive here uh, to close us out. And then we will transition to the rest of our lives. Yeah, I think the invitation um, in, was you could do a movement if you wanted in place of a word. So nobody's required to do a movement-based performance work right now. <laughs> but they're invited to if they'd like. <laughs> Um, this is Jessica speaking. I'm just going to say words because that's how I'm feeling. Um, rooted in gratitude. Check. This is Jess S. Um, I am bringing my shoulders up to my ears and I'm going to take a deep breath. And I'm going to let my shoulders drop. Marci Pichamishko, thank you. Take care. Check. Um, this is Carmen, and I'm feeling uh, held right now by everybody who is present. So thank you. Check. This is Lindsay. I'm doing a movement with my hands, which is kind of flicking, almost like I have water on the tips of my finger. Um, and it's like, for me, like little stars sparkling. Check. This is Mia. This is my checkout. This is Grant. Um, I'm sort of mushing my face with my hand. And then kind of like turning my hand around and just like feeling like the vibrations from my face. Like, <sighs> and then it kind of settles. This is Claudia. I am feeling like I just had a workout, but with my brain. 
So I kind of want to have a cool down routine and water. Check. I think we've yet to hear from Andrea and Landon. Um, if either of you would care to uh, close out, please do. Carmen, did you check out? Yes, you did, yeah. Hi, this is a, oh. Sorry, Landon, this is Andrea. Um, I'm feeling very overwhelmed, so I can't really think of any movement or anything. So, but I feel very grateful for everyone here. So, hi, landed on screen now. This has been a very interesting experience for me because I'm looking at what the structured zone is. And, you know, um, obviously there's some areas of improvement, but I'm, I'm very grateful to be in this environment. Um, and I, the word I want to use is content. I'm extremely content and thank you. So before any, anyone else does like the final, like, all right, and that's it. Um, just to let you know, thank you everybody for attending today's Unsettling Dramaturgy, Cripping Practice and Virtual Convenings. Um, our next one will be happening on April 20th and the one after that will be happening on April 30th. Please follow Unsettling Dramaturgy on Facebook. Um, look us up, say hello um, and uh, yeah, Thank you so much for attending. Um, Lindsay, Claudia, any final closeouts for us? Thank you all. Yeah, hearts. Yes, yes, and yes. Deep pleasure collaborating with you all. Looking forward to our next Praxis session. Thank you for helping us to create better practices. Just thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, HowlRound. Thank you, 